So I wanted to introduce my beautiful sister here, Gabby Galindo, uh, Mexica person as well, an indigenous person from these lands. Um, she's going to be here holding the fire, the Papal's comic with us, holding the space for us. So I just wanted to introduce that sacredness or sacredness to this space. And also knowing that that's part of what we do, we hold a space for each other, right? So that's the sacred fire. Uh, really, got, Gabby, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I come from the Quechua people. I'm a son and a daughter, a two spirits person from the Quechua Inca from Ecuador. Happy to be here, be here. Um, English is my second language, so forget my mistakes. Um, I like to begin by just opening up the directions with the Condor Way, so we all get up for a moment. And you don't have to really do a lot other than just like face where I'm facing. We're all together. Turn to the right. Turn to the right. Wish to mama. Ish to kunda mama. Wish to kunda. Turn to the right. Wish to mama. Wish to kunda. Ish to. Ish. Turn to the right. Wish to mama. Ish to kunda. Ish to kunda. Kunda wish to. Turn to the center. Come back. Towards me. Towards me. We we go to the sky. Wish to mama. Wish to kunda. Ish to. We go down to the earth. Wish to mama. Ish to. Wish to. Thank you so much. And as we do that, I also want to honor the ancestral elders and communities from this land, the Yul, the Rapaho, the Cheyenne people, the Shoshone, and the many communities that we continue to walk these ways in the right relationship and the best way we can work in the right relationship as well in this place based on the conditions that we have. So always honoring um, the elders of these lands. They're in the spirits form, they're in the trees, they're in the land, they're in the water. So many of them have been displaced, but they're still here. So we want to honor them every single time that we can. So I wanted to honor that to them. I also want to honor my tradition, the Quechua Inca people from the south, the Condor Nation, the Guacamayo, the Anaconda, the Puma people as well, the Andes people. Really happy to be here. Um, as always, I don't really know what I'm going to speak about. You know, so we'll see what comes, what ancestors want to speak for. You know, I don't, I don't speak for all indigenous people, but I speak as one of them, especially as one of um, a tribe member of my community. Uh, someone that has been granted permission to speak for our tradition uh, by consent. And we speak about consent today, which is really important. Have you all seen the videos or were you present in the, the, um, the conference, the psychedelic conference that happened last year? Were you able to see the protest when it was up there in the stage? Uh, who was there? Can you raise your hand? Who were present? Great, great. How many indigenous people are here? People that identify as indigenous? Good. Great, awesome. Good to see you. Good to have you all. Um, what I want to ask you, what is that you all remember, like some of the most important pieces that I brought up, or one particular piece that I brought up that it was really essential when I went up to the stage and I spoke to. I don't know if somebody want to just say something that you remember. Um, I, I remember from uh, the protest that uh, you reminded us that um, we didn't want to enslave the plant medicine mm -hmm. um, because um, they had already taken the tobacco, they had already taken the coca, they had already taken all of these plant medicines and um, strip them. Um, and you really wanted us to really think about what we are doing when we're going forward in um, the psilocybin space. <laughs> that was really Thank cool. you. Thank you, yeah, great. So along those lines, my introduction was, you have been deceived by this movement, right? And we're going to speak about that. Because the reality is that we're living at two parallel worlds as we move in this in these awakening, right? So it's really important to understand that the plant medicine movement has been carried on for generations already. Um, we open up our medicines in the south and all, some of the medicines were opened up here in the north. At least in the south we know from consensus from the elders that we open up to the city people around the 1930s, right? So I'm from the city, I'm a mestizo person from the city. So that medicine came to me, right? 
through my lineage, through my grandmother, but also that medicine was like the first form and when it came up to like understanding, wow, we have this beautiful medicine in the Amazon, right? And also all the other medicines in the Andes. And then we know that in the 1970s, more or less that time, the elders decided to open it for foreigners, right? The consensus was that we have done everything we could, we could have done in terms of healing and praying for the well-being of the planet uh, to remove the colonial veil to dismantle oppression. And, and we knew that really, we really need to bring on board our Western white communities, right? And, and we understand that at some point they checked out, right? So as community members and people from the earth, we live in a biorhythm in relationship to everything that is happening around. Everything is a relationship. That's how we see life. And, and we understood at some point white people and the Western world checked out and decided not to participate in that bio rhythm. And that started causing a deorganization of the, the balance of the planet. And that brought up so much chaos and things that we're going through right now, right? So we opened the medicines with the prayer that we wanted people to begin to check in by healing themselves and healing their communities, their spaces and all that. So as you, can, as you can hear, this movement has been happening for, for decades, right? So it's not new. It is new, it's a revival of the medicines within this, the, the, the Western sphere, right? Because the Western system pushed it out, right? Uh, it um, criminalized it and pushed it out, right? So it has been fully alive in our communities, right? So it's important to see that it's, even though it's a revival for the Western, it's not like it was dead for everybody. Right. It was only dead for those systemic spaces. So there's a revival there happening. So it's important to understand that, because when we use revival, it gives that connotation that it has been dormant, dead, or kind of like pushed out, which it has, because indigenous people has been marginalized, right? But we're still here, we still show up, we still come, we still speak, right? So that's when the first piece. On the second piece, um, around the deceiving piece is that Somehow this movement and how it's been moving forward, which this movement to some extent began with some of the pharmaceutic medicines, you know, like LSD and you know, MDMA and all of them. Those medicines is not a revival. It's a new medicine. They're just being given birth, right? So it's important to also see that. They're beautiful medicines. They have beautiful potential. I have partake with some of them. Um, there's pieces that we need to learn to navigate with them in different ways that we navigate plant medicine. Um, but they're two completely different movements, right? So at some point, this movement decided to merge both and created a one movement under the umbrella of the renaissance of psychedelics, right? Plant medicines are not psychedelics at all. And I'll explain that to you in a moment. Um, so it's important to see those two movements completely separate because in that, when they try to collide them both, they either consciously or unconsciously appropriate it or indigenous movement to make it more appealing to the Western white uh, spectrum, right? So it's, 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 it's important to see it in that way because otherwise we don't understand why is it causing harm. Right? When something is appropriated, it's literally taken away from the people that actually manifested it or where the roots are coming from or like the people who've given birth to this, right? So. That's the piece that is important to see that we have been deceived in this movement. When we put all together under one umbrella, which is the system, right? We see how the medicines have moved into the system by way of decriminalization and legalization, especially in the state of Colorado, and this has an impact in other states. What happened with this movement is that, either consciously or unconsciously, we actually handed the medicine to the system the reason I was against and many people were against around these was because we wanted to do it in a slower pace, really understanding of the impact, the harm, minimizing the harm, which is something this movement talks about, but they don't really leave it up to. They talk about harm reduction, but they don't do really much of that in my experience. To some extent they do, but there's a lot of things that they're not saying. So when we see that, then we understand that, you know, there are two completely movements that they might have some relevance to each other, right? Because they're still medicines, right? So we have a Western um, medicine that is being created and developed, and we have then ancestral medicines, right? So these are master plants. They're not just regular medicines for us in the South. We call them master plants, plantas maestras, which are like sent sentient beings that have intelligence. They have families in the spiritual realm. 
They're actually families of them, right? And we work with them in relationship, like the way I work with you and we work here, we work with them in the same way. It's a reciprocity oriented relationship, it's always dual. So it's not, on, not one sided. As we move forward with these women, we have to keep that in perspective, right? Because if we erase where this is coming from, if we erase history, then we're gonna cause more harm, right? So one of the things that a lot of indigenous communities and many other communities that have been more involved with this movement, really understanding the roots process, the ancestral piece of this, uh, we're having to create new ways within the system to protect, right? So a lot of things that we're having to create now could have been prevented, right? So now we have to do a lot more extra work, finding resources, finding community, finding people to create protections. Right, so that's the reason we were against it because we wanted to minimize the amount of work that we have to do. And the reality is that the people who are in power, the people who are closer to the center, the privileged people, they don't see a lot of these things. So the people that ended up having to do all these protections and all these is the people who are in the margins, right? So communities of color, black, indigenous people, transgender people. We have to step into the lines and like show up in different ways and say, hey, we need to do protections, we need to do more inclusivity, right? Plant medicine has an intelligence and they don't like to be used. They like to be in relationship with, right? And when we are on, on from the one-sided spectrum, meaning we're using them, eventually the plant or the spirits actually turn back on us, which is a little bit of what, you know, I spoke about in the conference and we've seen it, you know, we've seen it with coca, we've seen it with tobacco, We've seen it with opioids, we've seen it with so many different medicines, not just plant medicines. When we misuse it, at some point, they get a grip on us and they harm us. For some reason, we don't know. The only most viable way of human being to pay attention is when we begin to suffer physically. Not even just emotionally, but we actually, when we start struggling physically, that's when we stop and we're like, hey, wow, there's something wrong that I'm doing that is causing a lot of the imbalances in my system. Right? So understanding that and seeing the cycles that has been happening for a long time, like tobacco. You know, tobacco, I come from a community, uh, from the Cuyeloma community down in the Amazon. Uh, we're known as uh, tabaqueros purgativos, which mean tobacco people that perch. So we are in a deep relationship with tobacco. We snort it, we put it in liquid and powder, we drink it, we smoke it, we offer it to the fire and to ceremony. For us, it's medicine. You've never seen anyone down there who actually has a good, a good relationship, not to cigarette, but actual tobacco, who's actually get, you know, get sick from tobacco. It's actually a beautiful uh, plant medicine and spirit medicine that, that helps healing, right? But then when we see it here in the West, also down in the South, when you see the cigarette, right? When it has been deeply exploited, abused, and used in so many different ways, it causes cancer, right? So seeing those cycles, this is not new, right? So the concern of the elders and my community and many other communities through the Americas, and also this is also concerning other places as well in the world, people that you know, understand a lot of this, that rather than actually healing ourselves, we're actually causing harm to ourselves because we don't know how to work with these medicines yet, right? Um, so the calling out or the messages is not about not partaking, because we open up the medicines for people to partake. But one thing is partaking. One thing is coming to heal, receive the medicine. A completely different thing is to actually take the authority to say, I'm gonna serve the medicine, right? And that's where we're not there yet. So understanding that this is gonna take several generations before we can actually understand what these medicines are about. We cannot take these positions of authority and, and begin to serve. You know, it takes a long time, right? So I'm an ayahuasquero, and the medicine is in my blood, and not just in the physical realm, it's in my system. You know, many times I walked into different communities that hold different medicines, and people's like, oh, you're an ayahuasquero. People know it, because that's just in my system, right? It's from my tradition. And, and that comes, again, through consent. It's, that, it's not something that we seek for. Uh, we can have a desire, because we're humans, right? But we usually tender that desire and we become humble and just wait. Sometimes it's not for us, you know? Sometimes in our communities, 
overall is probably just like, you know, to do anything else that is also sacred, tending the land, tending the water, tending people, tending the fire, you know, working with different elements, that's medicine too, right? And some people have that calling and the right relationship to the medicines, the master plants, and that's their calling, right? So to hold ceremonies is not for everybody, right? And from this movement, that's the impression that we get, that this is for everybody, anyone can do it, anybody, anybody can take it. If you want it, <laughs> you know, the colonial mindset, if you want it, go for it and take it, right? It doesn't work that way. Because if you're sitting with people that don't have roots and connection, most likely, it might give you a level of healing here, but it might also make you sick, sick on this other side, right? So we have to be responsible. So we're sitting with people that don't have roots, know that also that might come with a, a, a price, right? Not just like an exchange of money, but also something I actually come on your health and how you perceive the medicines. The medicine is very tricky. The spirit is very tricky too. When they get abused, they play around with us too because they, they want us to see them, so they play with us. They mess with us. Right? I've seen a lot of people sitting for like 10 times in ayahuasca. It's like, oh, the medicine told me I'm, I'm supposed to be a shaman. You know, that shaman name <laughs> that's become so, so uh, trendy now. And, and then they go on, it's like, hey, I'm gonna do, and they go back to the Amazon for like another 10 days, and they come back and they start serving medicine and they're wearing, wearing old feathers and or regalias and all these things and things that they bought without consent, without being gifted. You know, all these pieces that you can see, wow, like you have taken. Everything that you're wearing has been taken and ruptured from actually the spiritual realm. And it might have some connection to it because it's still a fully alive, like feathers, you know? Um, but they're being erupted. They're not actually in community anymore. We took it away from the community, right? So when you look at my feathers, I have Macau and I have a beautiful condor, condor feather that was gifted to me. When I'm in ceremony and even in this space, when I'm in relationship with my feathers, I know that the feathers represent the spirits, but not just from one Macau or one condor, but it's the condor nation and the Macau nation from the south. From like the many places that I've been up here, especially in Colorado and speaking about these and participating in different groups as well, that it's a little mix of you know, indigenous people that have and understand this and a lot of people that are just beginning to think and understand what this means. And one of the things that I see is that people want to heal, right? And when we start looking into healing, we start looking at what is that we want to heal from, what is really happening, right? And when we go deep and deep and deep, one of the things that we see very often is that most people feel disconnected uprooted, really away from not just who they are, but like where they come from, right? And, and that's the deepest healing that we can begin to do. Start questioning who we are, not just individually, but culturally. Like how do we come to be to this place, right? How do we end up in this place in Colorado, right? And, and, and really beginning to do that generational healing to understand that the healing that you do around that is gonna have an impact for your ancestry and also for the generations to come. So everything that you do here is gonna impact the next seven generations. So it comes with a lot of responsibility, right? So when we serve medicine, you're not invited or handed the medicine until they know that you can hold this in the most pure and humble way because that represents that me holding the medicine is that the way I speak for it and with it the way I show up for the medicine, that's how it's gonna be carried on for the next seven generations. So if I mess up, that has an impact, right? So it's not a simple thing. You know, when I took, when I was invited to hold um, this altar, I denied for uh, three years. It took me three years to say yes. It wasn't my intention. Even though part of me was like, oh, this is so cool, I wanna do it, you know, my colonial site. <laughs> Um, deeply inside me, I was like, oh my God, this is, wow, I can't, this is so much, you know? So when I see this movement with so much trendiness, I'm like, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna move so fast, and we're gonna make money out of it, it's really painful. It is painful. First of all, because I see some medicine so, like, stripped of the land, stripped of the people, right? And then we see the people who actually hold these medicines suffering back home with so much uncomfortable dynamics. 
I was adopted into the Cuyaloma, and my elders are Mama Inez and Taita Luis. It's not my direct bloodline. So this is Quechua people from the Amazon. My, grandma, my grandmother is Quechua from the Andes. We know we're the same people. We know we're sister communities. However, it's not my direct line, or at least something that I can tra trace back now. Uh, but I was adopted, you know, over 15 years of working with them, going for my personal healing. And And when you're adopted in, 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 in those ways, you understand that you become a family member, that their fight is my fight, that their resistance is my resistance. And it touches me deeply because what I see happening a lot is that people take things from us and then they dispose us, they put us on the side because they haven't been adopted. Right? So they don't feel members of the actual that piece that they want to connect, they want to feel part of the earth. They're actually going for that, but when the time comes to actually do the work, they just take what they want, and then they go away. And then we're left behind. So one of the biggest pieces that I see happening in these people wanting to reroute, um, so it's a process of re-indigenizing. Now, re-indigenizing is a challenging label because that speaks to the people that actually hold indigeneity to that region, to that place, or to that plant medicine, right? People that actually have connection to those roots, right? So at some point, as Western people, especially as white people, we need to find our roots back home. And that will be our re-indigenizing journey, right? So we're beginning to open, opening up the path that is gonna lead us to re-indigenize at some point. And even those mestizos or people of color who are uprooted, what does it mean to indigenize? Where are my roots, right? So when we sit in different ceremonies or prayers that when you come and sit with elders, we'd ask that you, in our relationship, we help you through our roots, help you heal and go back and find your roots and begin to knock the doors to your ancestors, right? So that they start becoming online. And then begin, they begin to trust you because they don't trust us. They don't trust the world, the, the, the Western world. Because every time a root started to come up, whoosh, we caught it, right? We burn it. So that's another journey of healing those roots, healing, healing that ancestry, right? Um, so rematriation, it's a beautiful word, word that was coined by an indigenous person, which is a more appropriate for a general experience for everybody which is like the desire to begin to connect to the land and understanding that the land is not just this, but it's this too, right? So we're rematriating ourselves. Now, even before we can begin to do that, we need to decolonize ourselves. And I say this with a lot of respect. The decolonial work has been happening for a long time. I'm not the only one. There's so many people doing this work, especially led by, led by indigenous and uh, communities of, uh, black communities, especially trans and, and women uh, that have been leading a lot of this work for a long time, that we need to remove the colonial mind, work through the systems, because we have internalized the, system, the colonial systems in our way of thinking and our bodies, the way we show up are very colonized. We need to decolonize those spaces so that when we begin our rematriation and re indigenizing journey, we don't cause harm to ourselves. Because if you begin to do your indigenizing, your rematriation work without awareness of the colonial mind, what happens is that you like cut your roots as you're walking back in. And just to give you an example, myself, I was brought up in the city, even though I started my curanderismo journey when I was 12, I caused a lot of harm to my communities too. I was unaware of my entitlement and my ways of like, oh, I want this, this is medicine for my tradition, I want to come and you know. And the reality is that when you're adopted, you need to walk back really humble. These are families, these are communities, and we don't have any rights over them, right? Even though we want those rights, we don't have any because of the history and because how things have been played out, right? So we really, we really want to make sure that as we walk back in, that we come humble. And to reach that humbleness, we need to like unpack what is, it, what is that the colonial mind or the colonial paradigm continues to be part of my experience? Because if we don't have into that into perspective, we go back with those colonial veils 
and unconsciously we harm the same people we're trying to get healing from. So these people close down. They push us out, right? Then we feel even more disconnected, right? But it's not them, it's us, right? So decolonize, rematriation, and at some point also re-indigenizing, but really understanding that there are three different journeys, right? There is a movement that would speak to decolonizing work and decolonial work also being part of the system, right? So we want to get rid of that and just move into rematriation and reindigenizing. And it is true. And at some point we need to fully let go of that. But as long as we live in these systems that is very colonial, we still need to use that work and that work to decolonize so that we don't colonize our own roots. Does that make sense? So I think that's what I have to say for today, based on the time. So thank you, everybody. I'm happy to receive some questions and, yeah, or comments or anything. When you said that the path chose you, I was curious what were those signs that indicated that to you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to put it in words, right? I know the colonial mind always wants to understand, right? And, and, and that's a tricky piece uh, because a lot of these things, they come to you and you know is not something that you make up. It's not an idea. It's like a lived experience. It's like your whole system goes like, ah. Oh. And then someone comes to you. Like, you know, the teacher ap appears, as, you know, how we said in, in the Western world those teachers, those curanderos appear to you, right? So, and it's a journey as well of community living, right? We need to go back to the community ways. Uh, a lot of these things are lived in community, right? So down in the South, we don't take positions that are not granted. And when they're granted, they're granted by the elders and the community they have lived to, right? So they give you that position, right? So if the medicine chooses you, and then you're granted that the community around you who actually understand these medicines will see you as such. And there's no doubt whatsoever because the community gives you that position and they will treat you in, the, in, in that relationship because they know you understand. So that's a little bit of the science, you know? So it's not just how we, we sit now in the Western, the trendy world. Um, people will um, take the label of like, I'm a shaman, right? And then they start giving ceremonies and things, and they build community around it. And then all of a sudden the community looks at them as the shamans, right? But it was because they created the whole thing, right? So it's a manipulation, it's a power, um, a, a power imbalance situation where like you created everything for people to see you in a way. And it was not really the people seeing you for who you are, but the labels that you like took, right? Mm -hmm. Valeria, um, my question would be, you know, in the context that we're in now in Colorado, things are moving really fast. What are some things that we can do with where we're at right now? That's a great question. Um, there is not one answer to that. It's an unfolding of things, right? So we somehow have co-created this, right? Those who were pro and those who were on the backstage saying no, we're still part of a whole system that is like moving in so rapid ways, right? And, and, and this is something that needs to be happening in the sense of community. So I know there's community like this community, many other communities that are beginning to talk. So we need to talk. We need to sit together. We need to include indigenous voices. We need to include elders. Uh, we need to include people of color in general uh, to the conversations as we're doing it here. And, and begin to talk, how are we going to move forward with this? Uh, uh, a very important piece is that elders understand the medicines, but not necessarily the systems, right? So we need to begin to bridge those who are in the system to work together with the elders and see what can we do better, right? And those are conversations that need to happen. So there is no one answer. Um, yeah, we're in this together, right? Uh, we like to see it as you know, collective liberation, right? That comes from uh, the black community, really understanding that the people that are the farthest out actually have a lot more understanding of what's really happening in, right? 
the condor people, as my feathers here, and also uh, the eagle people, um, they're, the spirits are the ones that fly the highest, the closest to the crater, to the sun. We call it Inti in the south. And because they fly the highest, they have, they have the, like, the greater perspective of what's happening here, right? So they carry, they carry so much knowledge, and often they get pushed out. So we need to like, make an effort to bring them in, in a safe way. Many times they don't want to show up, and we also want to respect, because the history has been so bad for us that we protect our elders so much, right? But also there are many elders that we understand that we need to do this work and put ourselves on the front lines and, and talk to people and bring the wisdom, right? So there are many elders that are traveling, they're coming, so we need to center them and have these conversations. Mm -hmm. For those that are curious about uh, ayahuasca ceremony, is there a family group or ayahuasca that you would recommend uh, in Peru or otherwise? I mean, my community is always there. <laughs> there are many communities, you know, to be honest. Um, any community that you reach or approach, make sure that there's people that actually have their connection to their roots. There's also a lot of mestizo people like myself who have appropriate our own medicines and are serving medicines without connection. So a simple way to know if you're sitting with someone who actually understands this is like you can ask them, hey, who are your elders? What's your community? If people give you a lot of different answers of I sat here and here and here and here, that's a good way of like, yeah, I'm not going to sit with this person, <laughs> right? People who understand this work, they would never cut themselves from their roots, from their families, from their traditions. They will honor their lineage, they will honor their ancestors, they will name them. They, they know who they're sitting with because they have been adopted. So that's a good way to begin with, right? And yeah, and just, you know, ask questions. Questions are so important, you know? Um, we're not perfect, right? So even curanderos, we have something that they're known as brujos, which is people who actually are curanderos, but they use the medicine for power, for name and money. And we've always had those dynamics, right? So you also have to be a little cautious around that, right? So if curanderos are doing a lot of things that are not supposed to be doing that people can see, maybe you don't want to sit with them, you know? Uh, yeah, so just be mindful uh, around that, you know. Um, this beautiful medicine here, psilocybin, you know, is a beautiful medicine that uh, is everywhere in the world. You know, there are the connectors, right? There are the children of light. There are many spirits, actually. Um, and there are beautiful communities down in, in, in Mexico, right? And one of the things that happened in Me Mexico with Maria Sabina, it was like she was tricked. And then the whole community went down to a really chaotic, really harmful moment. Maria Sabina was taken out, you know, and the traditions suffer a lot. So when you approach them, you have to be very, very gentle and listen their lead. Allow yourself to be led, right? It's not about coming and, 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 and saying how things need to happen, right? And knowing that it takes time. You know, I, I know it takes a lot of privilege to be able to have the money to travel down to the south, right? I know it's challenging for a lot of people. And, and even here, you know, to pay for ceremonies up here, real, they're really expensive in general because of the flight arrangements and things that come into that and, and protections and things that need to happen around the medicines. Um, and at the same time, we have to understand that we want to go slow. So resisting the system that is pushing us to do so rapidly, uh, rapid things because we, need, we don't have the financial resources or the accessibility to things, right? So we want to go down for a week and like have it all done in one week, right? So we have to resist that because otherwise we're like entramp uh, putting ourselves in, in, into an entrapment of just doing it for, for the immediacy of the system that is pushing us to show up in a, in a way that is on, not, not, har not or harmful, not healthy, right? So my community is there. If anybody wants to reach out, um, you can always reach out. I serve ayahuasca down in the side once a year with my community, but my community serves medicine through the year. So I'm happy to send you there. You're hap I'm happy to have you to come with me, but you can also go anytime. And I, <coughs> I'm sorry, I also know other communities that I trust and I know for a long time that I can also refer you out. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about this trend that we're seeing all the time of compounding medicine upon medicine mm -hmm. and adding things to 
to situations and environments where you know the medicine is open to you and then you're trying all those things and how that harms you yeah so it comes in my understanding it comes a lot from that uh, longing to connect longing to reroute ourselves right so um, there's a lot of cocktails of medicine right like here are journeys people do a lot of different medicine in one day two days three days and it's all about wanting to feel the reality is that the colonial a reality that i see in the colonial is that because it has taken our ability to feel and then when we approach these medicines we come from that space of like adrenaline junkie space we've been deprived from feeling for such a long time we're so numb that when we go into medicines if we take like a, a cup and nothing feels nothing happens then we're like concerned right and then we went for more and we want more and we want more right in my community we tend to give one cup and a lot of times we begin with people very gently because we want people to relax we want people to slow down because in that relaxation space that's where you meet the medicine so rather than pushing the medicine to meet you you need to do your work also to meet the medicine right so a lot of what you were speaking to that's a very trendy space that comes from the colonial mind or wanting i want it now 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 and it's really dangerous i mean we've seen what we've done to the land to the space to the water to the food you know everything has been capitalized monetized privatized right from that desire of wanting more and more and more and more consumism, right? So we want to be mindful of that. So it's not about drinking a lot of different medicines or a lot of medicines, it's about the little medicine that you have, how can you meet the medicine? How, how can you slow down into that biorhythm? And also understanding that the medicine, a lot of times many of these plant medicines are not for everybody, right? Not everybody is ready for these medicines. Could cause a lot of harm. I've seen a lot of people dysregulated by the medicines. And it's not really the medicine that dysregulates, it's that the social environment we live in is not supportive to the work, right? So integration is a Western, Western way. We don't have integration down in the South. We drink medicine and we, we go back into like day-to-day -day activities, but because we're in activities with community, we're integrating. We're talking to people, we're talking to the elders. Things are happening, so we're integrating as we continue to leave be in community right here we're so entrapped into the systems that now we have to create these like spaces to integrate right so a lot of times it's not the medicine that this regulates people it's the environment that they're living in so they go into ceremony for a week and they come out and they go back to their work and they're like busy 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 doing it and because they don't have a space to integrate and that causes a lot of dysregulation in the system mm -hmm. You know, so that speaks to me to activism. You know, activism comes in different forms and different ways, and all levels of activism are important, right? Some people are active within their own communities. They don't have to show up so much, and that's okay, right? So you need to find what's your activism. What's your way to resist? Activism, activism is resistance, resistance to the system that is oppressing us. So questioning, <coughs> I'm sorry, questioning to yourself, how is that you want to show up? Right, so one of the things that happens here is like there's a lot of organizations in Boulder, Denver, around here that they do a lot of activism. There's a lot of voluntary work that is actually bringing healing to the community in deep ways, without any medicine, without any plant medicine. So get involved with them. You know, go and do social work, do some voluntary work, you know, feed the hunger, help uh, homeless people, people that have been on shelter, you know, help immigrants as well people that actually belong to these lands that have been pushed out, all right? Uh, so that's a lot of the ways to, to do that, right? And speaking up in spaces like these, you know, doing protests, you know, that's really beautiful. I know it gets a little tricky sometimes, but it's so necessary. We need to go and when they're holding, uh, when they're holding meetings and things where people are not really included, 
and the, the, the voice is centralized around the people who actually understand this, then we need to go and actually speak up. Right? And it's uncomfortable. Because when we speak up, people like actually begin to pay attention, and then the, the, the structure of the system became, uh, start collapsing, right? which is actually what we need to do. We need to dismantle the systems at some point. Right? So that's a lot of the things that you can do. Get involved with communities, do social work, begin to talk to people, begin to see where you can insert yourself by being welcomed by these communities, where you can actually bring some healing and support and show up for them too, right? Uh, in, in, in the psychedelic space also, it's like, what does it mean? You know, like if you're holding ceremonies, if you're holding medicines, uh, how are you speaking about it to people? How are you passing this down? You know, how do, how, what's the level of, of decolonial work you're doing in, in how you communicate this, right? So one thing that I can tell you that is happening in this movement that needs to shift radically at some point is that everything that is harm reduction is focused towards the human experience. So it's all about creating a safe space for humanity, right? And that, of course, plays out in systems, like depending how close you are to the system or how, how far away you are, right? So there's a lot of inclusivity, a lot of social justice around that. And the radical piece that needs to happen is that we need to begin to understand that when we work with plant medicines, we're opening portals. We're working with sentient beings, with families, with spiritual beings. And we need to learn to take care of the spiritual realm too. Which is, I can guarantee, most people in this movement are not doing any of that. Because they don't know how. Right? So then you can see these people are not ready for this. Because they're opening portals and things can come through. The spiritual realm is beautiful and it's tricky and it's messy. It's more messy than here. Actually, we're an expression of the spiritual realm that is here right now. Right? We don't see it, but it's right here. This is an expression of it. Right? So when we open portals to have a direct connection, there's a lot of things that come, come, come through to those portals. So indigenous knowledge, when we hold ceremonies, we have a specific ways of holding the container so that these aspects of the spiritual realm that are not organized or well balanced to the work that we're doing are not coming, coming through. Right? So one thing that I've seen in ceremony is that people, when people don't have roots is that you'll see all sorts of spirits just going through. <laughs> people leave the ceremonies and they have entities attached to them. Right? And, and these entities are, you know, they, they have their purpose too. You know, if you allow them to be in your system, in your body, they cause a lot of different things. Right? So we need to radically change that. So that's something that you can also begin to do in your communities and speak about what are we doing about this? Like, do we understand it? How are we going to move into the direction? Are we including indigenous voices and people who understand this, these realms so that we can do it in a good way, in a safe way for all of us? Which is something that we're trying to do a little bit in, in, you know, with DORA, you know, the new bill that is moving forward. So we're trying to insert ourselves into how the policy is being made, but it's still really challenging because we keep being marginalized so strongly. Right? So they just tokenize us. Like they take a little bit of us, and then they create their own thing. Right? And the harm is that eventually we're, we're dealing with things that they don't understand, like we don't understand, right? So right now, speak about this. Even if you don't fully understand, bring in the questioning. It's so essential, right? If somebody's like, oh, I got this. I'm going to hold this ceremony. I'm going to give psilocybin, and I'm going to do it in this way. It's like, hey, let's question this. Where is this coming from? Where did you learn it? Like, do you really understand this? Or can we look into a way to really understand this? So questioning is so essential. The colonial mind tends to be very fixated. It's like, I got it. I understood. <laughs> right? So we need to question it. So can you tell us what these words from the song mean? Oh, yeah. So this was a beautiful song that I wanted to play today, but time has gone really quick. If you all want to find it, it's called Tierra, which means Earth. So this is the translation. And the reason I wanted to uh, if you, you can pause it there. So you see the, the part with the quotation says, forgive them because they do not know who, who are looking for power instead of love. Right? This is so essential. This is a beautiful song that speaks to a lot of the dynamics of what's happening, like how we have actually abused and we continue to abuse. You know, Earth, the most beautiful of all, they want to sell your beauty your body, forgive them because they do not know who are looking for power instead of love, right? 
So that's the colonial mind. The colonial mind is always striving for power, right? So we need to find and question our minds. It's like, am I doing really this for power? Am I really doing this just for myself? Am I centering myself in this journey? Or am I really doing this for other communities, for the community itself? Because maybe at the end of the day, maybe there's nothing for me there other than just be in community, which is very powerful, right? But we have forgotten that. So that's why I wanted to show that because it is important to see that this movement in itself, as we know it as the psychedelic renaissance, is rooted in power and not love. So that's another piece that is, we've been deceived, right? It appears to be spiritual. It appears to be for love, but it's not. Maybe there might be some people, like some people here, you know, that they're showing up, but they're beginning to understand this. But as a collective, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so what, because a lot of the damage that is happening to a lot of the harm has been that since this movement took root here, or actually that's ironic because it didn't take root, you know, as we're speaking that these, this movement doesn't have roots, um, is that we were willingly disregarded and ignored and silenced and pushed aside um, when we were saying that, you know, this wasn't the way. So we continue to see that in the Dora board with people who have, um, you know, maybe some indigenous roots, but they're actually not from our communities. And with this Denver working board as well, you know, just all of these like different policy boards and people who are making decisions for our communities who aren't from our communities or who are saying they're, they are from our communities or even media sources. Like this continuous centering of people who are not from our communities, who are speaking for our communities and who are misrepresenting our communities and who are making decisions for our communities, <coughs> um, whether knowingly or unknowingly, but they're causing harm because they can't possibly, because they're not from our communities, they can't possibly understand the impacts that their decisions have. So, like you said, we're here now, but what advice can you give to people who, you know, like sometimes it's stepping aside and say, I'm not the, I'm not the right person for this, but I know this, this person does, right? Like you, um, centering you, uplifting the voices of the, the most marginalized people. So do you have... Um, yeah, what's the call to action for folks that, um, you know, want to do activism around the Dora border, these, these boards who, um, yeah, just continue to, to, you know, people just take these positions without mm -hmm. really understanding. You know, it is a tricky thing <clears throat> because we know it. And I say it's tricky because we know it, but when we want power, we don't pay attention to what we actually know. So. We, in that humble space of understanding that this is a community effort that is for collective liberation, we need to learn and begin to see what's our position, what's our, what's our role in this, right? And, and we know, even in the Western mind, the Western systems, that we just don't go and, and take a place of, like, I'm becoming a president just because I want to, right? So we know it's a journey, it's a process. However, when it's like, on things that are not on the system, then we sort of like forget. We play stupid, to be honest. We go like, oh, I don't know this, All right? So we need to know a place. So like myself to be here, like I'm not from these lands, right? I'm a guest in these lands. For me to be speaking up here, it took some time. It took invitation, it took consent, and I wouldn't be here without the consent of the people from these lands. Right, so I'm in relationship with, with some of those elders and people in the community that have allowed me and I have asked, can I go for it? Can I do this? And, and I do it in such a way because my medicine is at stake, right? We're impacted down in the South as well, right? So they understand. And because I, what I speak, it's also very close to how they speak, that they go like, yeah, go for it, right? So, but I also know that if at any moment an elder is someone from this community who's like, hey, good to me, or Daniel, Daniel, take a step back, I'll, I'll take a step back too, 
right? If my elders were here from the south, like, I wouldn't be here, I would be sitting with you, right? So we understand that hierarchy is important too, not as like top down as seen in the system, but is in a, in a circle way where we understand that even though we're in circle, there's people that have more knowledge and more wisdom and understand the relationship to the land where I'm, I'm at right now, right? So even myself, I have to understand my place. And I, speak, I can speak to certain things, I cannot speak to other things. I can speak to my medicine, to my indigeneity, to my personal journey as well, but I cannot speak for other medicines that I'm not part of, right? I can speak in a general way to protect those medicines too and say, hey, what are we doing? But I can never, never really speak for that medicine, right? I would never take that position, right? Because I know it's incorrect. And we know this. The Western mind knows it. But that's why it gets weaponized when it comes to communities that are not protected within the system. If we had protections around this, they will not mess up with us because they understand that once things are in the system, they're protected too, right? So now the medicines are being protected to some extent, but it's under the wide spectrum, right? So going back to that question, Gabby, it's like knowing, knowing our space, right? Also within communities, if you're an indigenous person, it's great, but if there's an indigenous elder, like you center the elder. Like I'm a mestizo person, I hold a lot of whiteness, when I'm in indigenous communities, I never center myself, unless I'm invited into, because I also have to honor that I white pass in many ways, that I'm a light color indigenous person. And I come with a set of things that are still colonial, even though I'm doing my work every single moment, because decolonization is not just like a one thing, time thing. It's like every single moment that you have to be aware and aware and aware. So centering those voices, right? So centering those spaces, those elders from those communities, so the harm that you mentioned, Gabby, yeah. Other people from other places, indigenous people, indigenous leaders, all of a sudden just appear in Colorado and say, this is how we're gonna do it. And we were like, hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. Yes, you're indigenous, you have medicine, but like you are not from this land. <laughs> like, wait a moment, like ask the people from this land first. Let's talk to us, let's have counsel. You know, let's have conversations about how we're gonna do this in, a, in the right relationship. That's the indigenous way. We've always, every time we travel, we go and talk to the communities before we just step in. We just don't want just walk in somebody else's house or land or property. You ask consent, but because indigenous people from this land has been marginalized and pushed down, people don't even pay attention to that. So last year, a lot of movements came and there were not indigenous people from here included at all. And when we tried to include ourselves, we had so much resistance. It was unbelievable because they didn't do the work. They didn't create relationship to the people of this land. They just came and colonized the space too from that colonial mind representing indigeneity because we cause harm too. You know, indigenous people, we cause harm too. People of color cause, cause harm too. So we have to know our place. We have to really question what is my place here and begin to develop relationships. Right, without being burdens to the communities, but like, how do you relate to them? Because the relationship is what builds the healing. The medicines are beautiful, but it's not the end. It's just a beautiful relationship that is helping us. So I would just say, if you want to close your eyes for a moment, just allow yourself to know that the condor nation is here. The condor elders are here, especially the rainbow condor people, which is my lineage, and allow yourself to receive the wisdom and their blessings as well. They're pouring blessings to us all the time with their wings, they're blowing, they're cleaning, they're removing that which needs to be removed, that which needs to be reorganized. And know that we need to reorganize our lives to find the biorhythm of the earth and live in the right, in the right relationship up here in the north, I love this phrase, I said the beauty way, you know, really begin to understand that we need to go back to the beauty way.
Mm. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you for your fire and this space, these altars. Thank you for your sacredness. Remember that you're sacred, that this life is sacred. We forgot that it's sacred. And to connect, we have to remember that we need to like awaken our heart, heart which is the first sacred fire that it's in actually our bodies, right? So remember that you're sacred and that you need to walk this life as sacred, knowing that everything you do has an impact and therefore is sacred, right? So keep that with you. Begin that work if you haven't done it yet. Begin to question what is the sacredness inside you and how you want to walk that sacred path. Because this life is very, very sacred. And in all the messiness that we still have, it's still very sacred. So treat it as such, all right, with sacredness. So thank you, everybody. If we get up and we'll do what we did at the beginning. So we all face that way. We turn towards the right. Towards the right. Right. Towards me. And towards the earth. And one more thing that I can say to wrap this up. I know this is a little hard sometimes because we, we have lost this. Our Western ways have taken this away. We need to treat these medicines and our people, our elders, our ancestral traditions that are still here, fully alive and fully connected. As such, we respect. The same way we treat our grandmother or grandfather or great grands or mother and father, right? So we need to begin to repair in our families how we treat them, right? Because we have lost that in our Western community. We put our elders in elderly houses, right? Because we want, we want them out. We need to bring them back in because it's a cycle, right? So the same way you would respect, hopefully from that sacred heart, the same way you would respect your mom and your dad and your grandpas, the same way Medicines need to be respected and re regarded in the same way, right? So always remember, is this how you will treat your family? Is this how you will treat your friends and community? And if not, then find a different way. Treat us well. Treat each other well. All right. Thank you. Cielo, aman tus hermanos, levanta el peso. ¿Cómo puede ser que el humano lo respeta? La ley de la vida, lo que nos sostiene, honra la tierra, reza al cielo. Aman tus hermanos, levanta.